Part two of Old Hampshire Vignettes by Lenoy Falconer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two, chapters four through ten. Four, Betty Lane. For one virtue they were conspicuous in the valley, the shining attribute that ranks next to godliness. In that they reached such preeminence as, like the munificence of the widow with her might, is only to be attained by the very poor. For what thanks have we for the cleanliness which costs us neither pains nor sacrifice? Whereas only by labor willingly added to a laborious day, and money cheerfully resigned from a scanty pittance, were some of these poor little homes kept as they were, immaculate, radiant. In one of these Betty Lane lived in maiden solitude. She is remembered, not for her quaint sayings, but for her proficiency in the now almost lost art of being happy. In this she excelled, and under circumstances, too, which at first sight might appear unfavorable. No relative remained to her, no companion of any kind shared her tiny cottage. Her income consisted of one gallon of bread and one or two shillings a week, and of this one whole shilling was swallowed by the rent and some precious pence must have been spent upon the soap and soda to maintain the dainty cleanliness already described lastly she could neither read nor write it will be seen therefore that to speak in the language of the hour she was physically emotionally and intellectually stinted if not starved but after all perhaps privation contributes to delight since that existence which the rich and the learned and the loved can find so flavorless this poor ignorant lonely woman tasted with exquisite relish in these sad days when the air is full of moanings over the weariness and emptiness of life her friends are perforce reminded of this gifted being as often they have seen her in her lilac cotton gown and coarse gray shawl eating with keen enjoyment her simple meal of bread steeped in the tea which some visitor from the vicarage or the manor had bestowed on her turning towards us as we read or chattered to her brows furrowed eyes hollowed lips sunk with age and yet all alight with the glow of inextinguishable cheerfulness five old castleman beside the huge fireplace where the wood fire crackled old castleman sat all day long in an armchair of the least luxurious kind resting as on the brink of the grave a man has good right to rest whose working day has been nearly eighty years long carefully valeted each morning by a devoted daughter he appeared always in full dress as it were in a suit of thick dark cloth with hat and gaiters all assiduously brushed he himself was very handsome with clear fair skin blue eyes and an aquiline profile one of the remaining few of a fine type that flourished it would seem in the hard times and languishes perversely in these prosperous days from his warm inglenook he viewed with sleepy indifference the play in which his part was over kindling into sudden eagerness if a word or a face recalled actors on whom the curtain had long fallen here is miss julia come to see ye father do ee know her oh i knows her well ee know and knowed her grandfather and her great-grandfather too i knowed em well many a time i've a zeed and ridin with these dogs about em in a red coat with a pigtail down his back and your great-grandmother she was just about a fine lady the manliest spoken woman in the county still he was sufficiently alert in mind as well as body to welcome a little company and even some reading from other books besides the bible he enjoyed a joke too in due season once only his sense of humor was known signally to fail when an afternoon reading had been slightly prolonged then even the antics of his favorite heroine mrs brown were received with such unwonted coldness that the reader dimly conscious of failure paused to ask timidly and tentatively she was a funny old lady wasn't she castleman ay and mine's a funny old stomach it wants its tea 
six the postman the road through the valley was a very lively one sometimes no less than six vehicles would drive past in one day and as we knew them all as well as their drivers the procession was always entertaining at least twice a day there would pass along the road a low yellow pony cart drawn by a swift little pony to whom the driver a small dark man with a meek and deprecating expression would whistle encouragingly it was the boast of good the local postman that the affectionate little animal required no harsher urging but there were those in the valley who did not hesitate to suggest that the whistling worked such wonders because firmly associated in the pony's mind with the stab of a sharp goad used without mercy by mr good in his travels when rabid lovers of animals like the young ladies from the priory for example were not there to see this was not the only instance in which according to his own statement mr good was the victim of cruel misrepresentation he very nearly lost his situation because seeing his pony cart so often and for so long a time stationed at the door of the ashburn arms uncharitable observers had inferred that he went in there to drink the beer for which the inn is famous when his real errand was to buy a bible which he was taking out in parts evidently there was some difficulty in collecting those parts so much so that on more than one occasion mr good came forth a little confused by the delay when accidents occurred which though trifling in themselves created a good deal of annoyance mr blank for instance was much vexed when his post-bag instead of being conveyed as directly as possible to the nearest post-town was left hanging all night on a post by the wayside and mr dash was no less displeased when the valuable plans he had dispatched to his architect one day were found on the next reposing in the avenue how mr good appeased mr blank is forgotten but he explained to mr dash's tender-hearted wife that the plans must have slipped out when he was wrapping his own coat round his little son to protect him from the damp cold of a november evening with what special object the infant at such a time accompanied him remains unexplained but who could be long angry with mr good how engaging was his confidence in the sympathy of others as when at the local midsummer races he leant over the barrier which divides the enclosure from the common ground to propose that uncle herbert should then and there advance him his usual christmas box wherewith to back the favourite and how sweet the temper that enabled him to receive with complete good humour the rebuff of a prompt and decided refusal seven mr farley one of the showiest equipages that drove past was undoubtedly mr farley's a high spring cart drawn by a young and animated horse not long accustomed to the restrictions of harness directly he became so or as too often happened smashed the shafts to atoms he was exchanged for another not always his superior in years or in wisdom but horse-breaking fondly as he loved and foolishly as he followed it was not mr farley's chief or ostensible profession he wore the fur cap of a costermonger and the red-wheeled cart conveyed from door to door the fish and the fruit by whose sale he earned his living and partly defrayed the expenses of his more dramatic but less lucrative calling he was a slightly built man with a thin brown face and keen black eyes over which his forehead puckered shrewdly his words were few but like his wit ready and the high-bred calm and self-possession of his gaze and manner nothing was ever known to ruffle with what equanimity did he meet those rebuffs which attend the display of inferior merchandise i don't think much of your oranges observed uncle herbert once when a basket of this fruit was submitted to him by farley fust red oranges hm how much ten a shillin ten a shilling why i can get them at brown's for a penny each brown ain't got any like these 
a good deal better farley silently proceeded to peel one of the calumniated oranges with a rusty pocket-knife and a remarkably dirty thumb the fruit thus daintily prepared he then offered to my uncle with the gracious words tryin no thank you said uncle herbert recoiling i'd rather not then i will said farley and ate it forthwith with equal relish and philosophy uncle herbert or some one else did for old acquaintance sake buy a shilling's worth of his oranges but on the whole we were unprofitable customers and suffered accordingly you never come to see us now farley said my uncle in a tone of gentle reproach one day when we chanced to meet him what's the good you never buys nothing yet with true greatness of soul he still cherished a kindly interest in our comings and goings especially on horseback and once when a new purchase was being tried for the first time he called at our gates to offer some stony lemons and to observe over his shoulder as he drove away met the young lady and the new mare all a goin well eight daniels it must be by the law of contrast that after farley's lithe and erect figure daniels should next present itself to the memory daniels shambling along in a shabby little cart with the reins left dangling as safely they might be on the shaggy back of his sleepy old horse daniels kept a small dairy farm and executed commissions for the gentlemen of the neighborhood he was fat and swarthy in color wore rings in his ears with a vivid blue handkerchief under his copper-colored chin and bore a vague general resemblance to the countryman of the stage though unlike farley who made his home in the nearest town daniels spoke without any cockney admixture the true vernacular of the valley he was not a saxon pure sang a celtic strain was suggested by his complexion his volubility and his almost oriental courtesy the last quality imparted a grace to the dullest business interview so adroitly did he interweave its dry details with delicately insinuated professions of admiration and regard i see the young effer sir t'other day at firmer coles over by sartin there as had a just about zoot you i says to farmer cole says i there's a gent up our way as is a bar sight better farmer nor you and me says i and that there effer says i might zoot ee what was it like a little beauty sir you may depend on it for i shouldn't wish to offer you no other how much does he ask for it well he did name blank pounds oh nonsense i wouldn't think of giving anything like that just what i says to him mr blank just what i says to him tis no use says i to try and impose upon that gent says i for tis a gent as knows a lot about cattle and i wouldn't stand by to see him put upon neither says i etc on such a high-strung level as this it is not easy to maintain one's footing even daniels himself made a slip at times never failing however to recover himself instantly with equal agility and grace have you seen the cattle thompson has in his yard just now asked some one who did not love thompson i've seen em i've seen em shockin bad they look to be sure shockin bad you know he has one of mine amongst them now i thought i seed one as zinned better nor the rest a person so fitted to shine in society was naturally tempted to linger at the ashburn arms with consequences which led to what in the valley was called unpleasantness between himself and his female relations his niece polly in particular who had lately risen in the social scale by a brilliant marriage with a young man in the ironmongery line objected to her uncle calling at her house on his way home from market in an advanced state of intoxication one afternoon we met him so overpowered with sorrowful emotion that he had not a pretty speech ready for one of us his story as he told it though affecting was difficult to follow but we gathered that polly with almost regan-like brutality 
had flatly refused to receive him till he was sober. "'Ow would you like it?' he sobbed, addressing my uncle and waving his whip towards the niece who stood waiting in the background. "'Ow would you like it if you was so served by that, that outstander there?' Nine, Old Jack Away from the villages and the water meadows, on higher and bleaker ground, whose solitary silence was broken by soft tinklings, old Jack spent his days. In more senses than one might he be spoken of as a son of the soil. He had the appearance of having sprung from it, and of betraying, even in his colour, the nature of his origin. For the hue of his long loose smock, and of as much of his skin, as hair untrimmed by razor or scissors permitted us to see, was the same as that of his native mould when rains have not deepened its delicate shade of brown. There remained his eyes, closely resembling, though without the same gleam of intelligence, those of his constant companion, the sheep-dog. For in profession Jack was one with the curled darlings in rainbow-tinted garments, who in some spheres of art are called shepherds. Never has the clash between realism and idealism been more painfully illustrated. Nevertheless, Jack was an excellent shepherd, and here nearly ends the record of what is positive concerning him. The rest is chiefly negative. He could not read, nor write, nor calculate, nor even take thought for the morrow, insomuch that his master was required to take it for him and pay the chief part of his wages in needful food and raiment. Of interest or opinion, beyond his sheepfold, of fear or hope or joy or sorrow or any emotion whatsoever, he gave no sign, save indeed that of one perennial aspiration, which found utterance in the only words he was heard by most of us to utter, "'I should like to drink your health!' "'A fine day, Jack. Yes, sir, I should like to drink your health.' "'Have you seen my little dog, Jack?' "'No, miss, I should like to drink your health.' This was his one form of greeting, of response, and of comment, addressed in the same placid tone to all newcomers, from the pedestrian who nodded good day to him across the hurdles to the rider who as in one instance thrown most willingly across them landed horseless and discomfited before him and though it is easy to laugh at this homely phrase it would be difficult to find another at once so brief so genial and so generally appropriate ten granny lovelock Granny Lovelock, towards the close of an active and healthy life, was confined to her bed by paralysis, which did not, however, diminish the sharpness of her wits or of her tongue. And picturesque as she appeared, propped up against her snow-white pillows in scarlet jacket and stiff-frilled cap, her large-featured face, with its keen cynical eyes, was far from suggesting that meekness and resignation which we too readily expect of the aged poor. Like most persons of repellent manner and short temper, she received a good deal of attention, and received it all as her due. Unprofitable servants were we made to feel ourselves, even when we approached her with propitiatory offerings, and there was always some point on which we failed to please her, some sin of omission or commission. For instance, how painfully dull was our village compared with the next in the valley, where, as she often severely reminded us, the gentry did zummit to amuse poor folks. Why, here, she cried reproachfully once to a maiden lady, no longer in her first youth, I never see such a place. We don't have so much as a wedding. Religious reading was another matter in which it was difficult to satisfy her for if we did not read a chapter we were guilty of neglect, and if we did she made us feel, by her constant interruptions, that our renderings were spiritless and tedious. Any attempt to improve the occasion she at the close wisely forestalled by herself delivering a short address on what she considered the moral. "'There, now, hearken to that. 
don't that show what sinners has to look to if they don't mind their ways but tis no good for any one like bill jones to call hisself a christian and then go spreein all over the country with a lot of low fellers and some makes a wonderful profession to be sure but they don't hold to it bless ye why mrs brand when she came here five years since she was singin hymns half the day she'd whoop and she'd holler and you'd have thought she was an angel from heaven in spite of these strictures granny lovelock's own religious position appeared so indefinite that somebody ventured to ask her one day to what religious body she herself belonged well i am nothing so to say granny lovelock candidly replied and then went on to recount how she had been driven from the bosom of the established church by the inhospitable conduct of mrs smart the pew-opener who had turned granny out of a pew into which shortly afterwards she had unblushingly introduced her own father-in-law and his wife at which gross instance of nepotism granny rose and rebuked mrs smart before the congregation and then withdrew for evermore this did not prevent her highly disapproving of those who changed their religion on insufficient grounds and especially did she condemn mrs stuart who having given the methodists all the trouble of converting her immediately joined the baptists in politics she took a lively interest but of such a kind as to justify the accusation that her sex is incapable of any but narrow and personal views for her judgment of measures was apt to be decided by their indirect effect on the movements of the family at the mansion and abhorrent to her was the man or the party who by prolonging the parliamentary session delayed the return of these kind friends what a durable bother to be sure she once remarked meester gladstone seems a nice kind sort of a gentleman why ever don't they let him have his way End of part two.